So the technical issues are gone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last seminar uh, of the year. It is a pleasure to have Paulo Brás, a colleague from LIP Coimbra, um, as the speaker for, for, for this occasion. So Paulo uh, works on the Dark Matter Group uh, at LIP. He completed his, um, his PhD uh, last year at the University of, of Coimbra with work on the Luke Zeppelin collaboration. So for his thesis, uh, he made detector sensitivity studies and uh, also developed machine learning tools for pulse signal classification. Currently, uh, is also the data analysis coordinator for, for the experiment. And today he will present to us the first physics results released uh, very recently by, by Luke Zeppelin. So uh, last but not least, Paulo is also, um, uh, he, he also joined um, uh, the XLZD uh, consortium for third generation dark matter observatories, uh, which is a novel and promising path in dark matter um, direct detection experiments. So please, Paulo. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, for inviting me to, to the the seminars I will look. Okay, so I will present the first dark matter results from the Zeppelin experiments. So these results were, were um, released and published uh, July 7th, this is past July. And they are the culmination of the, the, the first science run um, from, from LZ, we did full capacity. I will just uh, uh, make a, a brief introduction to the collaboration. So we are, uh, we're, not as big as some collaborations that, that LIP works with, but we are a pretty big collaboration, um, around uh, 250 people, um, uh, between PIs, PhDs, technicians, and uh, researchers. Um, we, we work with um, 55 um, institutions from four countries, and um, uh, LIP actually represents Portugal on, on, um, on, on LZ. And um, okay, and, and I'll, I'll I'll just do a, 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 a an overview of the detector and, and the experiment later. I will just start by an overview of dark matter, something very quick, just to, to get things started. Okay, so um, this conundrum started um, in in the '30s when Fritz Zwicky was trying to understand um, or, or measure. Um, the mass of, of, of galaxy clusters, in this case, the common cluster, and using two different methods, there, were, there was a, a very large discrepancy uh, between the values that he was obtaining. Um, his, his intuition was to, to infer that there was missing mass in the system that could not be accounted by, by one of the methods, uh, the, the, the luminosity measurements. And so he called that missing mass dark matter, first instance of, of, of coining the term dark matter. Um, later, uh, Vera Rubin, which is a, a very important um, figure on, on, on the history of dark matter, uh, also noticed that to explain the, the flat galaxy rotation curves that we were observing, we would need to either discard Newton, Newtonian dynamics or, or modify it in some way or introduce missing mass to the system. And so um, the, the, this, this intrigue for, for missing mass in cosmological systems was, was uh, uh, cemented and, and, and people were, were really um, interested in understanding exactly what's, um, what's happening at the cosmological scales. Um, so now we have a lot of, of evidences for, for the existence of, of this missing mass, so this, this dark matter, um, uh, from a, a very large scale of, of um, uh, um, of cosmological distance of cosmological scales. Uh, we have the cosmic microwave background, big bang nuclear synthesis, large scale structure formation uh, that cannot be explained without, without a, a cold dark matter component, um, baryon acoustic oscillations, uh, uh, even uh, semi direct uh, uh, gravitational uh, uh, inference from, from um, uh, galaxy cluster collisions which is a, a very important evidence, um, which is not directly tied to the, to the other ones. And, um, and obviously the, the galaxy rotation curves as well. And uh, the, the most important 
part in this is that not, we don't have, uh, it's not important that we have a lot of, of evidences is that they all agree very strongly on uh, the quantity of dark matter and the nature of dark matter. Um, so this is an, an old uh, agreement plot. Uh, it, it's, it's no longer this good. Um, this is the latest Planck results, and, and they show uh, a very strong agreement between very different observations. Um, I, and I, I put this here um, in, in, in this uh, uh, the phase space with a, with a Hubble constant, just to, to note that we still don't understand everything because there is there is a, 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 a tension between um, the measurement of the Hubble constant uh, with, with cosmological inference and and uh, uh, astronomical observations from the Sophie variable, uh, variable stars. This is a huge issue. Just just to say that we don't understand the full picture yet, and and um, there are still some 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 kinks on our model of the universe. Um, but so far. We, we, we can all agree there's, there's a consensus that uh, there is dark matter in the universe and, and it's, it's in the majority of, of the, the, the matter content in, in the universe. And uh, the, the lambda cold dark matter, lambda CDM, is, is the standard model of cosmology for a reason. It's, it's uh, well regarded as, as, a, as a, a model that can explain uh, the dynamics of the universe. Um, essentially, this, this model is just a combination of uh, a cold dark matter component and dark energy, since these are the two driving uh, forces, driving uh, uh, ingredients that, that shape the universe and shape the structures that we have. Um, so between the two, they, they account for 95% of the universe, which means that uh, we, we, we don't understand, we, we only understand 5% of the, of the universe, essentially. So um, there's a lot of things that we, that we don't yet know how to, uh, well, to characterize. Um, if, if someone asks me, what is dark matter? The answer is, I don't know. We, 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 do, we have no idea except for the fact that it's, some, it's, it's not the things that we know. Um, for example, it's, it's, it's not a, a particle from the standard model. It, it, it should be something else because no, no particle from the standard model of particle physics really fits what dark matter must be. Um, it does not interact with the electromagnetism of, uh, uh, um, or uh, the strong force. And it only has um, uh, uh, observable gravitational um, interactions. Um, it's, it's nearly collisionless and most of the evidence suggests that this is, this is true between dark matter itself and uh, between dark matter and, and baryonic matter, the regular matter that we are uh, used to, to interact with, um, it must be stable at the time scale of the universe. It doesn't mean that it, that it, it needs to be stable. It might decay. It, it only means that the, the, the decay rate should be much larger than the age of the universe. Um, it should be non-relativistic, which means it's what we, what we call cold dark matter. Otherwise, the, the, the large structure formation that we observe could not be formed uh, in the way that, that we observe them. And, uh, uh, and there is a very tight constraint on, on how, how hot the dark matter is. Uh, and it must be really abundant. And, um, and so we have no idea what it is. So I, I will define it loosely here as a, an hypothetical substance because it might not be even be a particle. So a hypothetical substance that is massive, stable, or long-lived, chargeless, weakly interacting with itself and another one. Um, about the candidates for dark matter, we have a lot of them, <laughs> but we, um, uh, we, we, we cannot even settle from, for, for, a, for a mass scale. So um, it's, it's completely insane that we, that we go through 80 plus orders of magnitude for the mass, and, and we can still find things that could probably explain dark matter in, in, in each of these uh, uh, mass scales. Um, I, I'll just give a few examples of very well-motivated um, candidates for dark matter. Axions, which is a well-motivated uh, um, boson-like particle, which, which in itself works more like a wave-like dark matter because uh, it's, it's low mass, low momentum. So it's, uh, 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 it's its characteristic wavelength would be much larger than uh, uh, regular matter structures. Um, in some cases, even the, the problem wavelength would be even larger than, than the solar system itself. So you wouldn't uh, 
uh, behave like a particle if we try to to, to directly uh, uh, interact with it. So, um, but these these axioms were were brought up to solve um, a, a problem in, in QCD, the strong CP problem. Um, and then the good thing is they are well motivated because they can potentially solve that issue while also explaining uh, 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 dark matter or the subtraction of dark matter. And they, they are uh, very, very low mass, which again, wave-like, some other challenges in detection. Um, we also have dark photons, for example, which, which would be uh, what we call vector portals for, for the hidden sector, uh, the, um, uh, a, a sector of, of physics that we don't have direct access to. Um, neutrinos could also contribute to dark matter. All, they, they would contribute as hot dark matter because they are relativistic. So um, even though they do contribute and we, we expect them to contribute a, a fraction, and we really don't know exactly the fraction, they don't contribute as cold dark matter. So they, they cannot explain uh, fully the observations. Uh, the sterile neutrino is, is something else. Um, hopefully, we, we, hopefully it's not it because we, we wouldn't have a chance to to, to observe them directly anytime soon. Um, weakly interacting massive particles. This is most of the things that I will talk in. It's what is the, the goal of, of LZ is, is to detect this type of particles. This is a generic class of particle. Um, essentially any particle that fits the description of dark matter and is generated by a, a, a physics model, usually the physics beyond the standard model, and, uh, an extension of the standard model will, will, will have some weakly interacting massive particle that is stable and, and that could explain dark matter. And it's also important because it's, uh, well, I will, I will talk about that in the next slide. We also have like ultra heavy dark matter candidates, things like cue balls or wimpzillas, which are uh, their own thing. And the, 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 the issue uh, with, with ultra heavy dark matter is there is a correlation on the local density for, for dark matter and, and the heavier they are, at least the least number of particles we need to, to, to fill that local density. So um, they, they have their own challenges in detection. And, and we, we also cannot exclude massive compact halo objects. Um, this is a broader term for things that are not exotic. These are the objects that we know that exist, like brown dwarfs, um, uh, uh, cold stars, um, miniature black holes and and these these things we know that they exist and they contribute a fraction to dark matter because we know that they exist and they, they, they are not non-luminous they are very weakly interacting on the on the on the scales of things in the universe and um and they are massive so they will contribute a bit uh, but they are extremely well constrained by observations uh, uh, which obviously we we don't see dark things flying around in in, in our observations of the, of uh, uh, astrophysical objects um, okay, and I, I mentioned wave-like and particle-like as well. Okay, I will focus on weakly interacting massive particles, which is a very well-motivated uh, uh, candidate for dark matter still. Um, it has been for, for, for a few decades. Um, it is a thermal relic from the Big Bang, which at least most of the, of the, of the models that generate these WIMPs uh, tend to have, tend to have this, this, this neat feature, which means that if we have a generic particle which interacts at the, the electroweak scale, um, it, it, and, and it, it interacts at the electroweak scale uh, either itself or regular matter. Um, within this mass range, um, we we would have uh, on 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 the grounds of annihilation rate and the expansion of the universe, we would have the correct density for dark matter today. So it's it's so we call the wimp miracle. It's a terrible name, but it, it essentially means that uh, uh, it's it, it's a model that easily uh, generates and justifies um, uh, the observations. Um, there are several extensions of the seven model that will produce uh, WIMP-like particles, which is great. So we have a lot of things to to test. Uh, I, I put here quite a few, and this is to motivate uh, something that I will mention later, which is the direct detection of dark matter. Um, we still have a lot of phase space to cover with a lot of interesting models. Uh, so we are we are now working to probe this region of uh, of these interesting models. Okay, so on 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 dark matter detection, we have essentially three ways. I think we're most familiar with uh, uh, these these three ways of detection of detecting astro 
particle physics, ast uh, uh, astroparticles. And um, uh, uh, the first one would be production of particle colliders. Obviously, uh, we are well familiar with, with what happens at, at, at particle accelerators and colliders. So if, if, if there is a, in, in any way uh, uh, a connection between uh, the dark sector and, and, and our, our uh, standard model, it might be a way of generating dark matter particles in, in particle colliders if you have the, um, uh, the, the, the required uh, energy. Um, indirect detection is essentially just looking at the universe and trying to see what would be a signature of uh, uh, an annihilation or a decay, which would be characteristic of any dark matter candidate and wouldn't fit anything else. Um, uh, it's essentially, there's, there's a lot of, of, of surveys or uh, looking at very interesting places where we know or you can infer that there is a lot of dark matter, like dwarf spheroidal, ga spheroidal, spheroidal galaxies. Sorry, um, and 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 essentially that 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 gives us a, a, a very tight bounds on on a lot of information about the the way that dark matter would interact if we could observe it. And also we have direct detection, which essentially is searching for dark matter scattering with a target material, which means we are directly measuring a, a, a dark matter particle interaction. Um, I, 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 also, this is this is a very um, uh, particle-like dark matter uh, uh, statement. Um, with wave-like, the, the, the detection mechanism is, is a bit different, so we need, we need uh, different techniques, but the, the idea is the same, is to let the particle come to the detector. Okay, on the direct detection side, um, okay, I will, I will focus on particle dark matter for this. Um, so, well, we, we are fully aware that the things we are trying to measure are, are very difficult and it should be a very rare process. Um, uh, it, it doesn't help that it's non-relativistic elastic scattering that, that we are sensitive to, so we have a very small energy transfer. Um, and we, we, we can play with the kinematics to um, uh, to choose the best targets, usually um, for, for the energy ranges that we, are, we expect we, we to have. They mostly only interact with the atomic nuclei, and, and some nuclei are better are, are more kinematically favored to uh, to, to to get uh, a recoil from a, a dark matter particle. Okay, and this is a very rare process. It's it, it helps that we have a, a very kind of large flux of, of uh, dark matter particles um, at our location. So there's a wind wind uh, going across the Earth and across the Earth-bound detectors. Um, this is due to the movement of the sun around the, 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 the Milky Way. So it, it moves, it drags along the, the, the halo of dark matter. And so we, 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 we feel that wind. It's, it's a very large flow, uh, very large, large flux of particles. So it, it tends to, to, to help. Um, not, not really, the cross section is still incredibly uh, uh, small. So, um, and, and just to give an idea, um, considering the current best limit, which is the one that I will talk here, spoiler alert, um, and, and considering a, a xenon target and wind mass of 100 GV, which is a very uh, typical uh, middle of the road um, mass tail for the local density of dark matter that we expect from, from our galactic halo models, um, and our Hertz velocity, we would expect around, okay, this is unfortunate, but this is uh, five events per ton of xenon per year. So ultra rare uh, um, uh, event rate. And the, the, the recoil energy is on average three keV. So it's really small energy transfers. So we need to have a very sensible, very low threshold detected. Okay, so low rates, low energy, we need to be almost background free, otherwise we can't see anything. Um, at these energy scales, we, we, we cannot be background free. There's a lot of uh, uh, environmental backgrounds that we cannot get rid of. So we, we, we try uh, do, to do our best to, to exclude or reject backgrounds from our experiments. Moving underground is, 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 a, is a necessity. There's no way we can do this at the surface or, or in space. Uh, there's just too much cosmic radiation for that. Um, we have to have high radioactivity detector materials, and this is this is also a must. Um, we, we need to deploy passive and active shielding. Uh, this often goes as as uh, 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 adding a water tank, for example, for for stopping neutrons from from entering the detector, and and also having active veto detectors surrounding the detector. 
Um, good position resolution and judicialization is also extremely important. This is tied to the to the uh, uh, the neat uh, idea of having a target material that is also very dense, which means it's self shielding, which means particles from 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 background sources like gammas and, and such would have uh, uh, more difficulty in, in, in getting into the target volume, the, the center of the target volume. This is, this is shown here. So we have a, a very uh, a, a very big uh, difference between the, the rate um, at the center of the detector and, and on the edges. Um, and, and this attenuation is, is really important for, um, for excluding backgrounds. Uh, we can we can sequester the most sensitive part of the detector, which should be in the middle. This is this is for uh, um, uh, two point six MeV gammas, so it's very very good attenuation at this at this uh, at this scale for for LZ in this case. Uh, we also have need to have good energy resolution and threshold again low energy. We have a lot of things that we uh, uh, need to get rid of, but we can't, and and so we, we need to 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 have the ability of of discrimination discriminating the, the energy signature. From the background. Okay, and then I touch on some of these subjects. Why xenon is a very well motivated. I mentioned xenon before. This is what LZ uses. Um, liquid xenon is incredibly dense. It's roughly the density of of uh, of, um, of uh, a granite rock. So it's incredibly dense. So it's self shielding. Uh, active vetoing. This means it has a good potential for position resolution, which means that we can. We can uh, uh, identify a particle that interacts in the edges and a particle that interacts in, in the center of the detector, so we can fiducialize it. Um, so it has high ionization and circulation yields. This is good because we need to have low threshold, so we need uh, 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 as much uh, energy quanta as possible uh, to be generated in an interaction. Um, it's transparent to its cell scintillation light, which is something that is not immediately obvious, but it's very important. High purity is, is very easily achievable. High atomic mass, which enhances the, the wind dark matter cross section, which is proportional to, to the atomic mass squared. Um, and, and obviously, if, if we are going to look for 100 GV WIMPs, we, we want something that is on the same order of magnitude in the nuclei of Zealand, in, in, on average, is, is, is uh, around that, that value. And we get the bonus of having sensitivity to some low BD decays from, from Zener isotopes. Okay, the LZ experiment essentially is, 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 is a, a bucket with seven tons of xenon, um, seven active tons of xenon. Um, it's an ultra low background TPC. Uh, obviously, it's, it's designed for dark matter searches, but it's, 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 a, it's a rare event observatory. It, it, it does much more than, than, than dark matter. Um, the, the TPC is observed by uh, two arrays of PMTs, 494 PMTs in total uh, from the top and bottom. Um, and it's uh, it's surrounded by two additional detectors um, that, that are a, a incredibly good addition for LZ and part of the, the good results that we have is, is due to these two detectors, uh, which is a skin, which is very hard to see here, but it's something that is really around the TPC. So it's displaced xenon that is outside our, um, our uh, active volume um, region. And since it's displaced, we, 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 we thought, why not uh, um, in, instrument it with PMTs so we can, we can have uh, like a single phase Zener detector. And uh, uh, the, the outer detector, which is these green volumes here, um, it's, a, it's a, 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 a gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator, which is very good for, for um, neutron tagging, which is one of the main backgrounds from, uh, from, from WIMP search because WIMPs interacts with nuclei, we want to avoid things that interact with nuclei, preferably as well. Um, and all of these instrumented volumes are submerged into a water tank, again, for, for, for passive shielding, which is also working as moon video, so uh, passive and active shielding as well. Okay, LZ is installed at SURF, uh, which is a facility um, in, uh, in Leeds, South Dakota, in the US. Um, it's at 1.5 kilometers deep. And, uh, and this, this is an overburden of, of um, uh, 4,600 meters water equivalent for, for attenuation of, of, of cosmic ray muons. Um, this is no longer true. Uh, it, it was used to be a 10 meter elevator ride, but it's now much faster, thanks to Dune. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and it, it's, it's pretty much on the same level as Dune is going to be installed. Okay, the, the, the overview of the TPC, just check. Okay, yeah. 
Um, the TPC has, has well, four main components. We have a, a PDFE light reflector cage, um, which essentially is, is a, a very good VUV reflector, which is the, 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 the wavelength of, of the scintillation of, of, of xenon. Um, this is to enhance our ability to, to, to collect the scintillation photons. Um, we have four woven steel grids, so I will think I'll try. Okay, so this is this is the outside of the TPC of the of the light reflector uh, reflector cage. Um, this is just a gift, so you can see the, the mesh grid that we have. Uh, in this case, it's the bottom uh, grid. We have four grids. Uh, one at the bottom, the cathode, um, and and the anode and the gate, which produce uh, the, the the electroluminescence extraction region. Um, so I mentioned the. The, the, the BMT arrays. Um, and we have a double walled cryoset vessel to, to, to hold the entire TPC together at cryogenic temperatures and for, for stability purpose. Um, and just a note, this is made from the most radio pure titanium that, 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 that can be found. Um, this is essentially because it's, it's a very heavy part of the, of the detector. It's very close to the TPC. We don't want any, any radioactivity on that. Okay, this the skin detector again so this is the TPC. This is inside of the, the, the inner cryosat vessel where the TPC fits. Um, it's also um, covered with EPDFE for light reflection and it improves light collection. Um, this is this is the bottom of the of the the the, the, uh, the bottom PMT array, which we, we can see here some, some PMTs to, to detect light from, from, from the in the skin. Um, and so the idea is this is an active veto. We we, we Dark matter interacts so, so rarely that we won't expect it to interact twice. So if we see something interacting in the TPC and also in either of the, the steel or the OD, we exclude the event because it's, it's definitely not the topology that we are expecting. Um, okay, same thing for the OD. Uh, 17 tons of gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator with 120 PMT readout. Um, the, the, this PMT is also uh, uh, see part of the water tank and the, the water volume for, for new in vitro. To have a very high neutron video efficiency, um, we also have a very high uh, uh, neutron efficiency um, uh, for for that scattered once in the TPC, which is one of our main backgrounds. So this is also one of the main drives for uh, for the, the sensitivity the, the sensitivity that we we, we reached. Um, this is a, a note on this. This insulation yield is, is also wrong. Um, this is a, the older value we actually found uh, in commissioning that we have a much much higher insulation yield, which is is great. Okay, this is uh, an image of, of the, the OD after being assembled. Okay, so we can see the video. That's fine. That's why I, I have, <laughs> I think now I have to do this. Okay, so I have a backup, an, an offline backup. Okay, so the, the operation principle of the TPC is very simple, but a particle interacts in the liquid in volume. Uh, we, get, we get a primary scintillation signal, which we call the S1, which is a, a very narrow, Signal we you can't really see here because it's not a scale, but this is nanoseconds and this is microsecond scale. Um, it's, a, it's a light signal, so it's, it's very fast, it's very narrow, uh, also very small. Um, and and we, we with that scintillation light, we also have some ionization of, of the xenon. Um, if we didn't have any any electric fields applied, the, that that uh, ionization would recombine with more scintillation. Unfortunately, we have an electric field applied for, from from the grids. So some of these electrons are drifted into the top of the detector and they get to the anode uh, gate gap uh, in the liquid gas interface and they are extracted into the gas phase of xenon and produce a strong electroluminescent signal, which we call the S2. Um, and essentially, both of them give us energy because we can reconstruct the, 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 the quantum yield from, from each of them. And, and they, 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 they are correlated and we can extract uh, uh, the energy of the interaction from that. Uh, and you get a full 3D reconstruction of the interaction swipes so called TPC, right? So uh, we, we get the XY from the light pattern from the S2 in the top of the PMT array. And we get the depth from the difference in time between the, the two signals. So we know the drift uh, field. We know we, we, can, we, can, we can calibrate the, the conversion to, to position. Okay, just a, a quick overview of the, uh, the dark matter group at LIP um, and, and the, the roles in, in LZ. We have, a, we have actually one of the largest groups on this side of the Atlantic 
and we have been always involved in, in uh, a lot of um, crucial um, crucial tasks with NLZ. Um, we are uh, strongly rooted in, in data analysis, even since the, the, the early con the, the conception of LZ and the LZ um, uh, data processing framework. We have been working on many of the modules that, that, that process the data. Um, also been deeply involved in, in background modeling and um, that is tied up to um, uh, rare Xenon decays um, that, that we, we uh, have been leading for, for quite some time. And I, I, may, I may my PhD on this. Uh, also, also on this part, but, uh, this is the main thing. Um, we we are um, the developers and maintainers of of the, the slow control for for the experiments. Um, uh, all of all of the detector monitoring uh, is 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 essentially uh, run by 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 Portugal by LIB, um, and we also have the online monitoring, uh, which we call the, the underground performance monitor, which which is also maintained by us. This is this is the the, the online uh, check that everyone has to do in the shifts to to see if the detector is operating correctly. Okay, so going a bit faster. Um, as I said, we have to be ultra pure. So we we had a, a very strong radioactive screening and cleaning and cleaning list campaigns. Uh, we, we we essentially assayed every material that got into the detector. Uh, several times we 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 had high purity germanium detectors, mass spectrometers. We 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 did neutron activation analysis on most of the of the materials. Um, this is just to make sure that we understand exactly what we are putting in the detector. Um, obviously, we we also try to 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 keep radon in check. Radon is a, is a terrible thing; it is everywhere, and it's it's, it's the noble element is mixing with the xenon very easily, and 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 actually. Uh, leaks into the xenon from from the, the detector materials uh, and and um, and dust that might be in the detector. So we need to work in clean rooms. Uh, this is a, a, an assembly, uh, a part of the assembly of the TPC where we are lowering it into into the inner cryostat vessel. This is all done in a radon radon reduced clean room uh, to to minimize dust and, and radon played out on the walls, which we have very strong requirements that we met. Um, it, it can't be seen here, but you, you, we are here. We are looking for dust. In, in, in the many services of, of the detector, especially on the PDFE, which is incredibly um, uh, easy to get to, to, to gain static electricity, so it's just a mess. Um, so we need, need to, 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 to be worried about uh, krypton mixed with the xenon. This is, this is something that, that is left behind on the, um, uh, on the, on the, the extraction of, of, of xenon from the atmosphere. And, and we also well, we always have some contamination of, of krypton and krypton 85 is is a bad emitter a low energy so it's something that it, it's concerning for uh, for wind searches uh, so we, we have a, a, a essentially a, a chromatography distillation uh, uh, apparatus uh, that, that essentially um, uh, removes gradually removes krypton to 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 the the, the difference in in uh, 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 displacement capabilities in, in some uh, chromatography char charcoal filters. And so with this slag, we can essentially separate cleaner xenon from dirtier xenon with, with some krypton contamination. And, and, and this was done before uh, LZ was, was, was filled with xenon, uh, but we still have continuous purification in the ground. Uh, on, on that, um, this is something that we need to be very concerned of. We, we, don't, we, we can't have um, electronegative impurities on the xenon because they they will uh, remove electrons from 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 the, uh, the ionization channel and and essentially dampen our, our signal. So we need to to make sure that we have a lot of purity. And purity means electron lifetime. Um, and so we, we we constantly monitor electron lifetime um, over over a running period. And we have essentially a getter for uh, distilling the xenon in the gas phase, which is uh, uh, circulated with, with two slash three circulation pumps at a very high rate, which should have a turnover of the entire xenon for in, in, in two and a half days. Okay, so this is a, a timeline of uh, construction deployment and commissioning. So this all started in, in 2017 with the uh, conceptual design report in, in, in TDR. Um, some some highlights. Uh, the the grids were were completed in the spring 
of, of uh, 2018, which is a major effort for uh, for LZ. We 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 made the the, the uh, we we wove the, the grids ourselves and passivate them. So this was a, an incredibly challenging um, uh, endeavor. Um, the TPC assembly was completed on, on August 2018, and then we moved it uh, a couple of months later to underground, which was another um, another issue, another complication, because the TPC is nearly as big as it can get for for going through the mine and through the shaft of the the, the elevator shaft, and 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 that was that was nerve wracking. Uh, it was sealed in March 2020, and we started to to get uh, cold gas in in March 2021. We start seeing the first events uh, around this time, um, and then we completed the OD construction and OD filling in June 2021. And the Zealand filling was was completed in August September, so we could start commissioning. And after commissioning, um, we got to the first science run, which is. Uh, what I'm going to talk next. So we, we plan to collect 60 live days, which is just the goal is to prove that the, 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 the detector is, is stable and has, uh, uh, can be run in a, in a successful operation mode. Um, and we, we can have a first uh, uh, limit for a first, first result that shows that we are competitive. This is the, the goal that we that want. We, we, we collected data from December 23rd to 11th of May of this year. Um, and, and the results were, were published shortly soon. Okay, so we have a lot of calibration campaigns. If you see here, we have a lot of calibrations. So we need to constantly check if the detector is running as, as we want. Um, so we, are, we use a lot of uh, uh, sources to, to calibrate the detector. We have internal sources that are injected in the liquid xenon and, and they are mixed in the xenon and we can, we can monitor uh, uh, the, Volume dependent, position dependent, and energy dependent uh, uh, detector parameters and detector conditions. We have also external sources for, for a variety of, um, of, uh, of, of calibration studies. And we also have the DD generator, uh, which is you see here, the, like the plasma window, uh, which, is, which is extremely important for uh, uh, calibrating, calibrating our nuclear uh, uh, response, which is what I'm, what I'm talking about here. And on that, um, we, we have essentially uh, two different uh, types of interactions in, in this type of detector. We have interactions with the electrons and with the nucleus of, 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 a, of a xenon atom, which is call an electron recoil and a nuclear recoil. Uh, electron recoils are, more, are, are very hardly will be from dark matter, will be mostly from gamma rays and, and betas and neutrinos and et cetera. Um, nuclear recoils are expected for, for WIMPs, hopefully, um, but also from neutrons, some neutrinos, because we are starting to get sensitive to coherent uh, elastic mission nuclear scattering, and also alphas, but alphas are very easy to spot, they're high energy, so that's not an issue. So we need to characterize these two responses, and uh, we, we do that with calibrations. This is an example of using tritium calibration. Uh, in blue and the DD neutron generator in in um, orange slash yellow in here, and uh, and with this we can we can recreate these bands that we call the ER and the NR bands, um, and and essentially this this means that we we can uh, we can point to some discriminating power between ER and NR in, in our analysis, and what we measure is ninety nine point nine percent projection of ER leakage below the median quantile of the NR band, which means that there, there, there should be only 0.1% of the blue dots below this, this, this full red line. Oh, and all of this is obviously modeled with, with NEST, you know, with simulation technique. This is a very important tool that we have at our disposal. Um, and this, this comes along uh, later when I'll talk about simulations. Um, okay, so detector response. So this is a, a, obviously a very important step. We need to know how to reconstruct our energies and, and our positions and and everything else. And so most of the, the, the things we use for calculating the gains um, from the detective, if you, if you remember the relation on energy and S1, S2 signal is, is with these gains, G1 and G2. G1 is the light gain, which means uh, the, the, the gain in, in detecting a photon produced from, the, from this insulation light of the interaction. G2 is the uh, photon gain from an electron being extracted to the, in, in, in the in the electron luminescence signal. Um, so the way we do this is we fit uh, monoenergetic lines that we know of. Uh, we, can, we can separate them in S1, S2 space since they are 
very tightly correlated. Um, and we produce this, which is called the donkey plot. Uh, and and we, we, we can extract the gains from there. And this is something very important to note is we, we reach an, an, an unprecedented energy resolution with the LZ, which is something that we were not expecting. Um, it's very fortunate. We are at, at 0.64% sigma over E for, for the 2.6 MeV uh, Tallinn line. It should be not here. Oh, uh, it's here. It's this one. Uh, this is very important, for example, for the drill stable beta decay on Zinc 136, which is, is very on top of this line right here. So it's, it's very um, it's very hard to separate only with energy resolution, and um, and this is a very very incredible result because uh, this is very very close to the limits of of, of what, what can be extracted from from the very physics of Zinc uh, because of this energy correlation. So this is this is a really amazing result. Um, okay, on, on simulations, so we have extensive Monte Carlo simulations for all the backgrounds for, for characterizing and, and building our background model. Um, everything from trace radioactivity to detector components, all of this is is um, is uh, um, fed with material assays and, and detector and response measurements from from uh, the, the radioactive cleaning assay screening, uh, so that we know exactly what is in the detector. Um, obviously, we have all of these different sources that may produce uh, 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 backgrounds. Uh, a very important one is also this, this comes from cavern walls for high energy uh, um, uh, searches. Thank you. And, um, and this is something that I worked on my PhD a lot. It's very hard to, to, to get simulations of, um, of gamma rays coming from across a water tank, across an OD, across a skin, and across a TPC. It's very hard to simulate this. Uh, the statistics is, is terrible. You need to have some, some, um, some, some techniques that are developed for, for simulating these type of things. Uh, also, for everything else, uh, we, we have a very uh, um, robust monocle framework. We have a publication here if you, if you then want to, to check uh, what we do. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just uh, uh, one of the things that we that we have for for yields for for uh, light and and, and and ionization yields from from the best models that we use, and um, uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So that leads us to, to backgrounds. So once once we, we we establish a background model, we can compare it to what what we see, and so we have to characterize backgrounds essentially from from. The very low energies to what we call high energies, which is MEV scale. Um, so we have a full detector, uh, uh, sorry, full background model to fit to to the data. And what what we found is it, it, the fit is actually quite great. Um, there are some some kinks here and there, which, which is which are uh, uh, probably the things that could be improved in stimulation. But um, it's 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 actually quite incredible that we can fit everything so neatly since the very bottom of the of the uh, of the spectrum to the top. Uh, relevant for WIMP searches, obviously this is this high, en high energy, this, this doesn't, doesn't matter much for, for, for WIMP search. WIMP search is on this box that is closed in here. So the very, very low energies. So relevant to this, uh, we have essentially some dissolved beta imagers coming from, mostly from the Radon chains, from Radon that seeps into the, the GPC. Um, uh, uh, electron capture decays uh, uh, are, are, are also a, 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 pro a problem because they are very low energy. Well, we, they, they usually produce one energetic uh, X-ray energy cascades. And, and, and one, of, one of the things that I want to mention is this argon 37, which is a major issue for all of these types of detectors. So other collaborations and other detectors have, have, have major issues with this. This is something that we, are, that we are keenly aware that we need to, to understand very well. Uh, we also have long-lived gamma emitters, uh, neutron emissions from solar station. We have a lot of things. Obviously, physics backgrounds, so solar neutrinos is something that we 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 also see, and something that is well uh, not from physics, accidental coincidences, uh, which I will also mention here a bit, which is also something that we need to be concerned with this scale of detectors and the type of detector that we that we are running. So, argon thirty-seven is is. A very problematic is an electron capture, uh, uh, which which produces uh, 2.8 keV. So it's really really low energy. So it's is the bottom of our uh, region of interest. Um, it, it has a half life of 35 days. So it's it's hard to to, to manage. 
we can't remove them. It's not electronegative, so we cannot remove it easily. Um, it's, it's naturally occurring, so th there's that. It's also produced by, by cosmic spallation of some, some xenon uh, 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 elements. So um, it's, it's, it's very complicated to, to, uh, to deal with. The only thing is we can wait and, and, and wait for it to, to essentially go away. We can also model it from, with, with time-dependent uh, uh, analysis. And this is just a representation of where we expect the, the argon signal. We have, uh, this is the ER band, essentially. This is uh, uh, overlapping the NR band. This is a, a, a supposed wind signal, it looked like. This is for convenient digital stepping. So we, we know where to find it, we know where, where it should be. Um, on the accidentals, this is essentially on physical event topologies, which means that what, a, a valid interaction would be something like this, an S1 that triggers the event. Uh, we actually, well, most of the time trigger on the S2, but we, we have an S1 followed by an S2 from an actual interaction. This is within the physical drift region, uh, the physical drift time that we're expecting. Sometimes we see things that are outside the drift time, which means it's, it's not physical. This is a, a paired S1 with a, sorry, an unpaired S1 that was paired with an unpaired S2 things that are not correlated by, by the same uh, interaction. It's, and this, this essentially covers the entire uh, uh, phase space with its purest events that we don't, uh, that we, that we don't care about. Uh, we actually, the separation is very important because the unphysical events actually allows us to um, characterize the accidentals that are physical, that have physical drift times. So we can produce like uh, PDFs uh, where they're most likely to occur and why. Okay, so data quality cuts. I will go very quickly uh, on, on this part. So obviously we want to select single site interactions because dark matter will not interact twice without a detector. Uh, so none of these things with multiple S2s. Uh, we, have, we need to have an optimized fiducial volume. Again, we don't want the, 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 the edges of the TPC with a lot of background to the, the, the center. And then we have to identify spurious signals. Some S1s are not good, some S2s are not good. We, we, we know that things, um, uh, happen on, on these types of detectors that, that produce things that there are not physical uh, uh, signals, but they do look like S1 and S2, so we need to remove those. Um, this has signal acceptance loss, mostly from the S1 low energy, because we, we, we ensure that we have the S1 signal in three PMTs for uh, uh, removing as much random coincidence as possible from dark counts. We have a lot of of uh, uh, channels, so that is very likely. So this has a, a, an acceptance loss uh, that I will briefly mention. Uh, then we have time period cuts. This essentially is excluding periods of the tech instability. So we might have emission on the grids uh, that that will produce a lot of light on the TPC. We don't want those those uh, those periods to be to be included. So we exclude them in the system lifetime impact. It's not much. The detector is, is incredibly stable. Uh, and then we have. Well, pulse strains, uh, which is something that happens when you have a very large S2, and essentially you have delayed emission of electrons, uh, which will result in things like this, or uh, a delayed emission of photons, which might be from fluorescence within the detector. We don't know exactly, but this will produce high rate of events, and we obviously don't care about these events. So we need to cut them, um, and this is due. This is this is basically excluding a region after a very large S2 has occurred because this is tightly related with the size of the S2. And this has a significant lifetime impact loss, um, up to 30%. So this is our major uh, loss in lifetime on the experiment, because these emissions can go up to 100 of microseconds. So uh, tens or 20 uh, uh, events in a row triggered by this, this garbage. Uh, OK, so this is a, a lifetime impact uh, uh, overview. Um, essentially. With all of these cuts and these selections, we have a total lifetime of 60.3. That's why we stopped SR1. We got, oh, so I have a lot of time. <laughs> um, so this is the, the signal of sentence. As I was saying, um, we, we have a, a cutoff at, at lower uh, the nuclear recoil energy equivalent. This is mostly due to the, to the uh, S1 threefold coincidence criteria. We, we don't want uh, spurious events, uh, spurious S1s. Uh, so we have this, this trail off. Still, we get a 50% acceptance for, for nuclear recoil events at 5.3 keV, which is great. It's a very low threshold. Um, it can be vastly improved with some techniques and lowering this default emissions requirement. This, this is going to be a necessity if you want to study 
sevens from from boron eight neutrinos from the sun. Um, okay, the, the detector selection acceptance was measured with calibration sources. Obviously, we know what we are putting into the detector, so we can measure it. Um, and the event classification efficiency was was measured by this is this is a thousand or thousands, so much more than this uh, across seven years. Uh, the, the people in the data analysis has, have been looking for uh, have been looking at waveforms, things like this, much more well behaved. But, uh, so we understand exactly where our efficiencies are are going, but we had to quantify them uh, for our uh, publication, and 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 that that required a special dedicated absolute efficiency hand scan. Hand scan is what you say, how we call looking at the events. Uh, okay, so after all these cuts. This is what we're left with for the 60 live days. It's 335 events. Um, this is the, the fiducial volume that we defined with these kinks in here and in here um, for, for optimization reasons. Um, this, this junk here is things that are in our ROI but are excluded by essentially the ODN skin vetoes, uh, mostly. Uh, I don't know if it's okay, so I'll cut this up for fiducial volume. This doesn't matter. So, at, at, at the end, we get a 5.5 ton fiducial volume. We were expecting 5.6. It's, it's, it's pretty much it. And that means we have an exposure of 330 ton days, which is a very large exposure. So we have a very large attack, but it's very uh, easy to get. And most of this big fiducial volume was actually due to the skin veto, because this allows us to get this edge very close to the, to the wall of the detector, because we are excluding some, some events that go into the, that leak, leak into the skin. Okay, so um, bottom line, all backgrounds are within expectations. So we, we the data agrees with a background only model with a very good p value. This is um, the, 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 the dots as usual are the data points and the, the histogram in blue is, is the expected uh, uh, background model. Everything agrees pretty well. Um, and and, and we, we, we roughly get exactly the, the, the same number of expected events that, that we, we were expecting for, from, from the background model. Um, also notice the argon 37 kink in here, which is a very important, important find because this was once um, uh, uh, potentially seen as a, as a, a, a novel, novelty signal uh, for some experiments. And we, we essentially, uh, this disagrees very well with our argon 37 expectations. And finally, well, not, not the final slide, but very close. With all of these um, requirements, we we have essentially this landscape for S1, S2 uh, phase space. Um, the, 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 the regions that are highlighted are, are to highlight the argon 37, the ER band, and this, this counter here would be for a WIMP of 40 GVs, just to note that we don't have anything there. So spoiler alert, we, we find that we didn't find that better. Um, so, using uh, a, a very common statistical analysis that was agreed from, from most of the uh, direct detection dark matter experiments, um, we, we essentially took this data and we, we uh, uh, pushed a limit, we, we created a limit that, that pushed the, the, the uh, 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 scattering cross section a bit lower. On, on the, the mass phase space. And um, we get a minimum exclusion in nuclear cross section of, of 5.9 times 10 to the minus 48 centimeters squared, which is, which is great for a 30 GeV. So if you notice here, we have, we have a, a, a fortunate loss, a fortunate uh, hole of events in this region, which is not from, from uh, um, uh, uh, signal loss. So we, we have this region filled with our calibration. So this is uh, an, another fluctuation. And this is what allows us to have this, this pump in here, a very good sensitivity to lower masses. Um, and so with, with 60 live days, LZ is already the most sensitive wind dark matter detector. Okay, so what's next? Uh, we have, well, we, we plan to have uh, a thousand live days, so 17 times more exposure than we have right now. So we will continue to push the, the limits on, on, on wind uh, uh, scattering infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of science to, to be done. The, the, it was agreed that the SR1 was only for wind search. Um, we will use the data for, for some border data analysis as well, because it's low energy. We are, we are tuning the detector for that, but we are a very 
broad scope physics experiments and we, we have some skills to a lot of things. So expect on this full uh, exposure, some, some, some results on other searches. And as, as it was mentioned, uh, there is a, a new consortium, the XLZD, which comes from Zeno, LZ, and Darwin, which are the three large collaborations for, for Xenon dark matter detectors. And um, there was an agreement to, to join efforts to make a, a future generation experiment, not entirely settled, uh, but we are already meeting and, and getting ideas and, and, and designs. Um, this, is, this is a requirement. Xenon is, is incredibly expensive even, uh, even before. Now it's even more expensive. There is not a lot of it. Uh, this is a huge endeavor. It's going to be a very ex extremely expensive experiment, so we need to join efforts. We can have two or three experiments uh, in the near future for, for, uh, uh, for dark matter searches. And with this, we are hoping to get to the neutrino fog, which is, which is essentially a region down here, which I don't know why this doesn't have uh, the neutrino fog, but essentially so it's, it's where we, we start to touch on not being able to use this technique for, for searching for, for dark matter because of coherent neutrino nuclear scattering from the sun. Um, okay, we have a successful meeting and, and, and we have a white paper. And you have a very broad science reach, so this is, will be, be much much beyond dark matter, mostly on the on the part of the uh, uh, oh, where is it? The genus of There you go. This is, this is a very very important topic as well. Okay, and that's it. Thank you.